Uh, welcome to our uh, final uh, exchange talk this, uh, this session, actually, here at the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland. So uh, just to introduce myself very briefly, so I will be chairing this session with discussions afterwards and questions. Uh, my name is Oliver Searle. Uh, I am the Interim Head of Composition here at the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland. And uh, just before I introduce Sam, uh, I suppose I should also say um, uh, just a couple of things about the format of this. I realise one or two of you may have been to this already or one of, the, one of these talks previously. It's just to say that Sam will talk for around about half an hour and then we'll have plenty of time for questions and answers afterwards. Um, it's worth saying that you can either type some questions into the Q&A tab, which is sitting in the, in the middle of that bar at the bottom there. If you, if you click on Q&A and you're welcome to type a question in there if you would like to. Alternatively, you can put up your hands. Again, there's another function there to, to raise your hand. Uh, and I will actually um, then sort of unmute you if you want to ask a question in person. Um, but uh, you're very welcome to type a, uh, a question instead if you would prefer. Uh, so if I'd like to now hand over to Sam, and what I'd like to do is maybe just give a bit of an introduction to Dr. Sam Ellis. Um, so Sam gained a first class uh, BA Honours degree in music and an MPhil on chamber music in interwar Britain, both from the University of Wales at Bangor. He then undertook AHRC funded doctoral research on the music of Arthur Bliss. He lectured in music at Bangor for eight years, laterally serving as an advisor in arts pedagogy at the Higher Education Academy. And Sam came to Scotland in 2013 as a senior lecturer at Glasgow Caledonian University, specialising in professional learning and the pursuit of expert practice. He has since written and spoken extensively on curriculum design. Uh, and Sam is also a senior fellow of the Higher Education Academy. He joined the, uh, the Conservatoire here with us in 2019. So welcome, Sam, and over to you. Thanks very much, Ollie. Thanks for your introduction. Um, and thank you all for coming as well today. Delighted that so many of you are joining us for this talk. I'm just going to share my screen with you. So you can see my slides. Hopefully that's up there now. There we go. Okay, and as well, thanks, I think, very much due to my colleagues in Research and Knowledge Exchange for taking this Monday evening series online since March. Uh, this is going to be quite a low-risk, non-interactive talk on my part. Uh, low-risk as I stare nervously into the corner of the room at my home hub to make sure the light's still blue. Very happy to say it is. Hope it stays that way. Uh, but I'm really excited to read your thoughts and questions uh, at the end of my talk. Okay, so let's start with this title. Frozen music is a phrase that some of you may have heard before in the full dictum, architecture is frozen music, variously attributed to Goethe and Schiller, in which case it must be both accurate and profound. Well, we'll see. Anyway, what we do know is that it had become enough of a cliche by 1818 for Schopenhauer to dismiss it with characteristic snark. He said, should one perhaps speak of ruins as a frozen cadenza? Well, as my title suggests, every dictum needs its opposite. And if architecture is frozen music, well then, Music must be liquid architecture. Again, we don't know if anybody actually said this or not, but it's been attributed to Robert Browning and John Ruskin. And again, I find myself instinctively resisting these pithy one-liners. They, they so seldom seem to stand up to real serious scrutiny. But is there anything, briefly, that we can pick out of this comparison? What if we take it to extremes? Well, we might argue that pure music doesn't represent anything in a literary sense. And we might argue the same about buildings. A palace is a palace, a symphony is a symphony. Neither can be read like a book, uh, at least not when made flesh, as it were. The emotional potency of a palace or a symphony is more immediate, more visceral. But even this doesn't take us terribly far. So what then, form 
Well, OK, so in both fields, we might talk about classical balance and symmetry. But again, the road, the, the road soon runs out. Better, I think, is to think about the materials of art more fundamentally than that. Some artworks are static forms in space, like architecture. And some art forms, some material art forms, are dynamic forms in time, like music. We might say that music has temporality and motion in a way that architecture cannot have. And yet some terms that we use in music also appear in the architectural vocabulary. I'm thinking about the way we might look horizontally at a long Glasgow tenement and describe the arrangement of windows as having a pleasing rhythm or a graceful line. So far then, so spurious. But I have always found this pairing attractive. Ever since I was an over-earnest undergrad, I've long had my serious scholarly relationship with music, of course. But some of you will know, some of you will know that I'm also very keen, albeit in a strictly amateur sense, on architecture. I grew up in Norfolk, uh, where every village has a church somewhere between 600 and 1,000 years old. Sometimes the village has disappeared and all that remains is the church. Norfolk actually has 659 medieval churches, which is the greatest concentration anywhere in the world. So you must forgive me, and I hope you will, for taking hold of a private passion and running with it. Since I started working loosely with, the, with these ideas about 15 years ago, very few people actually have done any serious convincing historiographic work on linking these two art forms, music and architecture. My own attempts, I have to admit, have been pretty half-hearted. Uh, it didn't even make it into my PhD, actually. Far too risky, I thought to myself. And while I don't want to claim an inseparable relationship this evening, element by tedious element, I do want to argue that looking at these complementary art forms can help us to see differently some problems of style, fashion, and aesthetic. So let's put some of that to the test. Tonight's talk is really about a house. And this is a house which will help us to explore some aspects of style in Britain during the 1920s and 30s. And so as you suspect, the talk is about a bit more than the house itself. Uh, it's a little bit about architecture, as we've heard. It's a little bit about music, uh, but it's also a little bit about war. Uh, and it's a little bit about modernism and that amusingly British way in which modernism, despite its modernity, could never wholly leave the past behind. Yes, modernism has always had a surprisingly conservative streak. So to channel Lloyd Grossman, who lives in a house like this? Whose house is it? Well, it was owned and co-designed by the British composer, Arthur Bliss. In the early 1920s, the young Bliss was hailed as the bright light, the great hope of British music. He went on to write an important film score in the mid 1930s for H.G. Wells's Things to Come. And he also composed one of the most acclaimed ballets of that decade, Checkmate. From 1953, he served as master of the Queen's music, which is like the musical equivalent of the poet laureate. And yet, I expect that most of you don't know his music all that well. On the face of it, given that potted biography, this is odd. Most of you can probably whistle a few tunes by Elgar and Vaughan Williams and Holst. And the same may also be true of Walton and Tippett and Britton. But Bliss and Howells and Goosens and Moran? Well, I think that's probably unlikely, unless you're a chorister who happens to know Howells' Anglican church music. So why is that? Well, here's a possible reason. Let's look at when they were born. So for these men, the First World War was a very real experience. So real, in fact, that they all signed up in August 1914. 
Bliss himself was shot in the knee at the Somme, a lucky, shoot, a lucky shot to the knee, he always said, that got him home. Uh, and later on, he went home, well, he went back to the front for a spot of gas, again, in his words. Uh, and then we add in these composers, those composers who were killed or who were propelled towards the mental asylum. People like Butterworth, Coles, Farrer, Gurney, and Bliss's own brother, incidentally. Now, I know that biography is a blunt tool, but what starts to emerge here, I think, is what we might dare to call a lost generation in British music. And what's important too is the age of these composers as the war was ending, okay? So not 61 like Elgar, not 46 like Vaughan Williams, not teenagers like Walton or Tippett, but in Bliss's case, 27, and frankly, making up for lost time. So that when he was demobbed in early 1919, he found himself at the head of this so-called lost generation. And while biography can be a false friend, chronology is usually more helpful. And so we do well to remind ourselves that in these years, immediately after the war, many of the old guard reached the end of the line. Elgar had nothing to say after the cello concerto of 1919. Strauss was a shadow of the composer of Electra. Sibelius dried up in 1926, and only Janacek really managed to find a new, a new lease of life. Debussy and Mahler, of course, were already dead, just to complete the set. But let's zoom in on Britain. Britain in the 1920s and 1930s, a Britain in convalescence. In the aftermath of that dreadful trauma, the Great War, the key dilemma, the key dilemma socially and culturally was forwards or backwards. This was the great tension of those years. But I want to present it with a little bit more nuance. Uh, the artist Paul Nash recognised all this in 1932, even without the benefit of significant hindsight. Mind you, he knew better than most what the watershed the Great War was. He'd been there at Passchendaele, painting the swollen clouds and stinking mud, his words. Now, Nash asked whether it was possible to go modern and still be, be British. The battle lines have been drawn up, he said. Internationalism versus indigenous culture. Renovation versus conservatism. The industrial versus the pastoral the functional versus the futile. These might feel like polarizing discourses, but he is right on the money. So let's consider how one might have chosen to look forward to go modern. And let's look at this route through the prisms that I've chosen for this evening's talk, music and architecture, because we know, we know that in general terms, there are parallels between the two. In music, these years were characterized by an abandonment of tonality and to some extent of traditional forms. There were new and strange groupings of instruments. Increasingly, composers began to incorporate bizarre treatments of the human voice, screaming, shouting, singing nonsense syllables. I'm clearly not going to do justice to the whole of modernist music here, uh, but needless to say, as we tell our students at the Conservatoire, there is a pretty wholesale rejection of Romanticism. And similarly, architects embraced new materials and new technologies. They, they developed a radical new visual language based on abstract forms and minimal decoration. They believed in universal design qualities rather than specific ones. And superficially, at least, Bliss was at the centre of all of this. His inclination was explicitly towards the modern. After leaving Cambridge in 1913, yes, the year of Weber and Six Bagatelles, he squeezed in a year at the Royal College of Music, where he managed to fall out quite spectacularly with his teacher, Charles Villiers Stanford. Four and a half years later, Bliss, the war veteran, arrived home in an even less compromising mood. Rout of 1920 evoked a passing carnival 
as if heard from an upstairs window, screaming soprano and all. The Daily Mail was not impressed, and I'm going to do my best Paul Dacre impression here. Having heard several of these whimsical excursions, one begins to wonder where they are leading. Are they forming an individual style with which Mr Bliss will be able to say something when he's really got something to say? Or is he becoming a fashionable joker? In the tube at Oxford Circus went a stage further. My colleagues in the School of Music will notice in the cello part the direct mimicry of machines in motion, the chugging of an engine, the clattering of wheels. But note as well the rhythmic balance. It's four square. No sense of Stravinsky and unpredictability here. This is a machine that's being depicted after all. And again, the critics' notices were sceptical. Because musical taste is not sufficiently educated to appreciate good music, composers to attract promiscuous and indiscriminate appetites have adopted unsound procedures and make foul noises. Such pieces are written from a low motive and a bad impulse. But isn't it interesting, at this time, we see in Bliss's aesthetic not the abstraction of the atonal composers, but something I think more akin to the witty, descriptive miniatures of Sati. So a real French-German divide going on here. And it was around the same time, of course, in Paris, that Honegger was capturing the physical energy of the train in his Pacific 231. And we mustn't forget either the manifestos that Bliss wrote and the speeches that he gave, <clears throat> praising the frontrunners of what he termed the new development. Ravel, Bartok, Stravinsky, these composers, he said, truly stand as a body of a body for vitality and simplicity in music and express hatred of the humbug and pomposity attributable to their neighbours across the Rhine. You know, his colours here are nailed very firmly to a Parisian mast. Initially, I wondered at who he was casting the shade when he spoke about pomposity. Mahler, Strauss, even the whole Austro-German sound world in which the likes of Elgar operated. More likely, I think, is the perceived intellectual pomposity of Schoenberg and his school. But clearly there is more than one possible reading. Most of all, though, I'm reminded of the most influential poem of the early 20th century, The Wasteland, with a king at its centre who's trying to make his barren country more fertile. It's very hard not to see Bliss casting himself in that mould. Let's fast forward then. Fast forward 10 years to the early 1930s. Clearly, much had changed. Bliss was now not looking back exactly, but like Janus, he was now content to look in all directions. By now, it seems he'd lain his cultural prejudice against Germany to one side. He was no longer the chauvinistic war veteran. He now had a truly international outlook. And there's a whole raft of evidence here that I could present to you for this. You know, there's biographical evidence. He goes to America, meets the woman who would become his wife. There's musical evidence. He composes a, a large choral work all about the war, which unquestionably provides some kind of catharsis. And there's stylistic evidence too. And that's where the house comes in. When he yearned for a rural retreat around this time in the early 30s and bought a plot of land in Somerset, he and his friend, the architect Peter Harland, designed a house that was of the moment, not a rustic farm cottage, but a modern statement, or rather a statement in keeping with the mature modernity of the 1930s. This house you can see on your screen here is pure international functionalist, a gaunt ocean liner set on the edge of the Salisbury Plain. It's not really curvy enough to be truly streamlined modern. It was about five years too early for that, but let me see if I can show you with my cursor. The roofs are flat, you can see, uh, the water tanks are deliberately arranged to resemble a ship's funnels. What we see on this side, on this slide rather, in this illustration, is the south elevation with a wide sun patio, it could almost be the deck of a ship, on the first floor level. Uh, and beneath, an almost continuous window wall into the living room. 
And the ladders, you can see here, the ladders and other details, the various railings, are all quite deliberately nautical. This really is universal design. There's nothing parochial here. There's nothing local. In his famous lectures of 1929, Le Corbusier spoke of a single building suitable for all continents. I propose, he said, only one house for all countries. Now, I'll come back to a real piece of Bliss's music a bit later on, I promise I will. Uh, but people sometimes ask me, you know, what's Bliss's music actually like? What's Bliss's mature music like? And short of being able to play them any, uh, I usually say something like, well, it's essentially neoclassical and highly contrapuntal. So much more like uh, mature Hindemith is neoclassical than is Stravinsky. I think that David Meller would say, if you like the harmonic language of Walton and you like the rigorous counterpoint of Hindemith, you'll probably like Bliss. Although David Meller probably wouldn't have used terminology like that, I admit. And very unkindly, if you like Walton and Hindemith, well, why not just stick with Walton and Hindemith? Anyway, uh, in fact, my next angle on Bliss, if I get round to it, will be to look at the extent to which his musical language is codified in Hindemith's book, The Craft of Musical Composition. I suspect it's pretty close, but that's for another day. Except to say that some of you will know that Hindemith was from Frankfurt. He was German. So by now, in the 30s, we couldn't be further from the musical blinkers that once allowed Bliss to see no further than Paris. In fact, reflecting on his anti-German outburst of 1921, many years later, in 1970 in fact, he wrote, I confess to blushing on rereading what I then said, an embarrassment shared, I am sure, with many who later discover their hollow arrogance. There's a certain amount of intellectual elitism in my high art focus this evening. And certainly for Bliss's generation, the war was the defining moment. And yet, in wider society, away from Bliss's highly educated peers, it didn't necessarily produce a decisive break with the past. Against our backdrop of apparent modernity, mock Tudor houses sprang up. Deeply pastoral music was revered. Politicians like Stanley Baldwin conjured up a false utopia of country pubs, cups of tea, and horse-drawn plows. Britain's rural heritage was pushed to the fore. The evidence seems to suggest, though, that Bliss's modernist sensibility was much more sleek bunker than folksy cottage. Because let's be clear, an option for him would have been to take the lead from past historical styles, to continue in the historicist vein, to stick fast by arts and crafts and its revolt against mechanization and standardization and industrialization. People needed to escape and they escaped in their minds to the countryside, to thatched cottages, Tudor mansions, and merry England. Rather than turning their backs on the past, many people now yearn for it. In many ways, these years I've been discussing with you today are, were, intensely retrospective. Now, I think it would be deeply unfair of me to criticize Bliss's house merely for its location on the edge of Salisbury Plain, a country satellite of the Hampstead townhouse, but an uncharitable reading might find the Bliss family getting back to primitive roots, foraging for berries, but returning to London at the end of the weekend. How Nietzsche, how disgustingly bourgeois. But not as bourgeois, I would argue, as the miles of Tudoresque, half-timbered, half-pebble-dashed houses in the suburbs. In the face of that sort of thing, well, you can see why those with more cultured tastes were already craving a simpler, aesthetic. Urban high society demanded stylish modernism, but with classical ancestry, metropolitan, restrained, well-mannered. Buildings that turned away from decoration and from homely chaos and towards a more regular, symmetrical sense of design. And all of those stylistic elements that I've just outlined there are writ large in the public buildings of the period. And I thought it might be fun at this point to illustrate this with a couple of examples from here in Glasgow. Let's have a look what I've got. 
Firstly, uh, the National Commercial Bank Building on the corner of Bothwell and Wellington Streets, which under normal circumstances, I actually walk past every day. This is now a German style beer hall. So again, I'll get my cursor and you can see the fluted Corinthian columns there at the main entrance, rather nice classical detail. Uh, you can see the polished granite plinth there at street level. But you can see as well this incredible restraint in the attic story, the incredible lack of detail and decoration. This is by James Miller in 1934. And this slide I'm showing you now is uh, another Glasgow Bank building by Kepi and Henderson in 1931. <clears throat> the Bank of Scotland on the corner of Sockey Hall and Rose Streets. Another polished granite base there. Um, a tall round-headed porch echoing the bays around the corner. Kind of, kind of rather nice uh, symmetry with one another there. Um, and again, everywhere up above, classical restraint, symmetry, balance. Uh, and now what have I got for you? Well, an, an example from London, which I couldn't resist, I must say, which is the vast ship of Broadcasting House. And the ship allusions, I think, just as in Bliss's house, are fairly obvious. Um, except, accentuated front section here, vast bow, rounded and with masts, yeah? Portholes on the ninth floor there. Uh, the figurehead statue of Prospero, which actually sits there. It's not even present on this photo. Uh, modern exuberant, progressive, sleek sleek, sleek curves, I should say, clad in Portland stone. And next to Broadcasting House, I admit, Bliss's house looks more oppressive than impressive, angular, bland almost. It seems underpinned by tight structures, everything expressed through line and proportion. Okay, I think it's time to take some of this architectural vocabulary and see how it transfers to music. I could talk endlessly about Bliss's music of the 1930s. I'm not going to, I promise. But give me all of his music from 1932 to 1941, and frankly, you can keep the rest. All of his most mature, most characteristic music appeared soon after the house at Penn Pitts was built. The clarinet quintet, the viola sonata, the score for things to come. Music for strings, the ballet checkmate, the piano concerto and the string quartet in B flat major. So let's look at the viola sonata of 1933. Now in the great pantheon of interwar viola music and frankly frankly where would violists be without the interwar, re interwar repertoire it's not right at the very top. If you want great viola music probably stick with Walton or Hindemith but most obviously for the purposes of this talk the sonata itself is a classical form. More interestingly, I've picked out some of the key phrases from contemporary reviews of Bliss's viola sonata. Here they are. Sharply etched lines, fierce logic, virtuosic form, in total control of the material, strong foundations. I could almost be quoting an article from Architect Weekly. And for Bliss, I think, the great prestige lay in the classical world. It's his neoclassicism that makes him an intensely modernist composer. It shows him at last not rejecting developments in Germany on spurious national grounds, but engaging with organising principles also used by the Second Viennese School. Not organising principles of tonality, I admit, but certainly organising principles of motif and form. Another term that architectural historians use for the international style is rationalist architecture, which emphasizes its focus on logic and on rationality, of course, but also its repetitive forms and its rejection of Baroque and Gothic ornamentation. A very early building that crops up a lot in the textbooks is the Steiner House in Vienna by Adolf Luz, completed in 1910. It is exemplary in its rationalism. So how great a leap is it to suggest that this emphasis on regularity and proportion, on functional appearance, was in fact part of some forward-looking conception? In Bliss's modernism, to paraphrase Eliot, 
we simply see history asserting its immortality most vigorously. So what can any of this tell us? Well, for one thing, I think we know that Nash's polarities are a bit too neat to withstand extended historical scrutiny. For another, it confirms that modernism wasn't restricted to urban settings, even if its impact was greatest there. We can find it hiding away in the English countryside. And so can modernism make sense even when it isn't full-blooded, cosmopolitan and urban-centred? Well, yes, I think that it can. I want to finish by returning briefly to my observation that as a methodology for historians of artistic fashion, no one has really tackled the intersection between music and architecture. There's a book of conference papers from 2006, but it's not an idea really that's entered the musicological mainstream. But funnily enough, it is something that Nick Cook alludes to at the very end of his influential 2009 paper, Changing the Musical Object. In that paper, he's discussing in that section, uh, Webern's Opus 27 Piano Variations of 1936, and he compares the interpretation of the pianist at the first performance, Peter Stadlin, with a later recording by Charles Rosen. Stadlin received extensive coaching from Webern, who by all accounts encouraged a huge range of expression and emotion. Rosen's later recording, on the other hand, is cool, detached, abstract. So Cook writes, recordings like Rosen's, made in 1969, with their concern for objectivity and balance, construe Opus 27 as an emblem of post-war modernism, which is to say modernism in the tradition of the Bauhaus and the international style. When cultural historians, historians of architecture as much as musicologists, speak of modernism, that is usually what they mean. Yet with its focus on clarity of structural articulation, Bauhaus international modernism is strikingly different from the Viennese variety, the central conception of which might be said to be the concealment of hidden meaning behind appearances. The concealment of hidden meaning behind appearances. That is a great line, isn't it? And it suggests to me anyway, that Nick Cook knows his Adolf Loos, who remember designed the Steiner House in Vienna that I just showed you, the Viennese variety of modernism. And that also gets me thinking about all those other directions that I might have pursued in tonight's talk. Composer as musical architect, creating in musical time and musical space, balancing the density of musical events within a certain duration. Think, for example, about a scherzo and the slow movement in a late classical symphony. The scherzo movement is probably shorter in duration than the slow movement, and the number of musical events that passed his by keeps our minds busy. But the broader canvas of the slow movement means that musical events can be introduced at a more relaxed rate. In the two movements, there might actually be a similar number of musical events. The point is there's a proportionate relationship. There's a balance between ideas, time and space. The musical architect at work. Anyway, Cook takes the comparison no further. Frustratingly, he doesn't even pick it up in his, uh, in his 2017 article on recordings of Opus 27. But in that short quotation that I showed you, he offers a tantalising glimpse at the direction we could extend these parallels. But for now, uh, after about half an hour of listening to what I think were probably some fairly unfocused musings from me, you're probably thinking, probably thinking of that other famous maxim which connects this evening's two disciplines. Writing about music is like dancing about architecture. Well, indeed. Now, where did I put my ballet shoes? So, that's it. I'm not really sure how far frozen music and liquid architecture gets us. Not very far, I suspect. But what you've heard tonight is how I've approached music and architecture historiographically. And I'd be interested to hear about the connections that you make between the two. And here are my image credits. <laughs>
Sam, thank you. Thank you very much, Sam. Thank you. Um, so I suppose, has anybody got any questions straight off um, just now? You're very well to type into the Q&A. Here we go. Uh, and this is from Lucy. Do you think Bliss and the modernist architecture had an influence on stylistic choices made by the next generation? I'm thinking of Britain, Lutians, Tippett, McConchie. Yeah. That makes sense. Do you want me to read it again? Yeah, you can, you can do. Do you, do you think Bliss and the modernist architecture had an influence on stylistic choices made by the next generation? And the examples Lucy's given there, Britain, Lutians, Tippett, McConchie. Thanks, thanks Lucy, that's a, that's a great question. And it's one that, um, it's one that speaks to uh, Bliss's long-term legacy, um, especially given his position as master of the Queen's music between 1953 and 1975. Um, the answer I'm going to give is possibly uh, slightly negative as far as uh, Bliss's long-term legacy goes. Um, I don't know how much it speaks directly to the comp composers you've listed, but I'm sure in a in a sort of vague sense it does. So let me let me let me start with that and see see kind of where we go with it. Um, I was always very struck when I was a student um, and when I was doing my PhD work on this very subject actually as well. I had, some, I had some lecturers who were born in the 1940s, um, that's probably the best way of looking at it, who helped me to see this uh, issue of legacy and influence through their eyes. And that was, you know, that was really very important because obviously these people were formative people in my musical education. Um, uh, and they had a really useful perspective on what it was to be a young musician, say in the early 1960s, when Bliss was this figure at the head of the musical establishment. Um, you know, people like the wonderful uh, Robert Pascal, for example. I remember distinctly a conversation with him. Um, and they could not understand why I was wasting my time with Arthur Bliss. They, they, thought, they thought it was just a completely lost cause. Um, and of course, I realised to them, realised that to them, through these conversations I had with them, um, that for them as undergraduates in the 1960s, Bliss was this establishment figure. Um, you know, a master of the Queen's music, absolutely not in the Maxwell Davis mould deeply conservative, writing music which seemed absolutely uh, irrelevant to them, frankly. Um, and in Bliss's harmonic language, I don't think, looking at his whole uh, canon, I don't think he ever re really went further than the Firebird, say, or the Ravel of Daphnis and Chloe, um, which is fine in 1910, or even in, in, in interwar Britain, but not really fine for 1960, or when these composers that you've um, that you've listed were in their maturity. Um, a real offender for me is Bliss's meditations on a theme of John Blow of 1955. And you can see here, he needs, a, he needs an inspiration from something else. And in this case, it's a theme by John Blow, a theme from 17th century England. Um, and that work, honestly, even though it was composed in 1955, sounds like Brahms, um, or even less favorably, like Parry at times. I mean, it's so far from, 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 the, from the currency of 1955. Another problem for me, and another reason why I'd keep his works from 32 to 41 and get rid of the rest, um, is that he never really, he seemed to lose impetus as a manipulator of sound. Um, I've been, I did some work with the third year undergrads this year, where we looked, uh, we looked in one class at Debussy's Prelude de l'Après Midi, um, composed composed in 1894, by the way, uh, for those of you who don't know the work, and often cited as, you know, the start of the 20th century in music. Um, and I asked the students to analyse it as a, as a conservative work, um, as a work of its time and place. And we saw, or they saw rather, that behind its exotic melodies actually lay a lot of harmonic conservatism as well. Lots of tonics, lots of dominance, lots of implied perfect cadences. And I think that work by Debussy to our ears um, retains so much of its residual modernity because of its orchestration, because of the way it sounds to us. Um, and there is, why am I telling you this? Because there is just not enough of this in Late Bliss. <laughs> uh, he continued actually um, to write in just the way that Elgar would have used the orchestra in exactly the same way. Um, there's no doubt to me that the, 
early alignment of Bliss's music stylistically, the early stuff, things like Rout and In the Tube at Oxford Circus, is with Les Cis. Um, and one of the members of the, of the six, Honegger, expressed a desire, I've, I've, got, I've got a quotation here, Honegger expressed a desire not to break the link with the development of the musical tradition. He spoke a lot about, um, instead of changing the rules, what was actually needed was a new player in the same game. And post-1945, post-Peter Grimes, actually, seeing as you've mentioned Britain, post-Peter Grimes, Bliss wasn't just an old player in the same game. You know, he was in a completely different sports complex, actually, for want of a, to, to continue that analogy. And so when I was doing this work, to kind of conclude my answer to this question, sorry, um, when I was doing this work, I was, there was always a little bit of friction, actually, some tension between me and the Bliss Society. You know, a collection of really uh, admirable, actually really commendable enthusiasts for Bliss's work, because I wasn't just going to be a cheerleader, a, a, you know, a dogmatic cheerleader for this music. Um, I've never ended a talk on Bliss, I don't think, uh, with that awful line, his, his music deserves to be more widely known. Um, that, that line is perfectly valid when a composer has suffered structural inequality, as many, as many composers have. Bliss had not, he was a wealthy white man. His music doesn't necessarily deserve to be more widely known, I don't think, but it is a fascinating body of work through which to consider modernism uh, across the arts in, in, in 20th century Britain generally, I think. So in terms of a long lasting legacy, no, being absorbed into the, into the mainstream, not good, for, not good for his creativity. Yeah, as a follow up point, Lucy, I think there's a lot to be said for that. There's, you can think about composers sometimes, um, you know, we do it with Beethoven, don't we? We split them into periods very crudely. We think of a period where they're gaining their audience. We think of a period when they've got their audience and they're doing their best work for that audience. And then we think about the times, uh, the third period where maybe they're completely indifferent to their audience, or frankly, they've lost their audience or their audience has moved on. And to some extent that's true for Bliss. I think after the war, after the second war, after 1945, he recognized that he'd done the mainstream and the mainstream had, had moved on. And he could then actually himself be indifferent to the audience and do what he wanted to do. Fair enough, but it wasn't cutting edge. Thank you for that, Sam, and for Lucy for those questions too. Um, anyone else, does anyone else like to ask a question? You're very welcome to either type in or raise a hand. And I certainly have one. Nobody else would like to. If you'd like to, please just, please just type in, type away. Um, I actually wanted to pick up on uh, what you were mentioning about the kind of that aspect of the lost generation. And I suppose it's, it's quite interesting, isn't it? Because there's quite a number of analogies that I guess you could draw with, say, I'm thinking particularly kind of 1930s, 40s, say, uh, Jewish composers, for example, who may be, uh, com you know, composers and artists who perished in, in Auschwitz, actually. Um, and I just wonder if there's something in there about... I don't know, is it about that sort of shared loss of cultural wealth somehow that has some, had an impact? Um, and I wonder, yeah, I just wondered how, how that relates to it. It's obviously a very different situation, something that was imposed on a whole group of artists at the time. Although I guess in a way that you know, so the, the war was as well, wasn't it? Yeah. I, when you look at the social history of Britain, and I'm sure the social history of, of many countries in Europe although, you know, I'm British and my, my kind of academic interest is Britain, so I can only really speak um, from, from, with a level of authority on Britain. Um, you note, don't you, as I, as, I said in my, uh, as I said in my talk, that in the 1920s, there was this, this deeply nostalgic sense, this, this, this uh, desire to look back, a desire to seek comfort in the past, in things that were familiar, in the gentle. Um, we do it ourselves, you know, we look back to, uh, we often look back to the summers of our childhood and think, oh, those end of summers, um, you know, running through fields of wheat, as a certain prime minister once said. We, we, <laughs> we tend to wear rose-tinted spectacles and, and nostalgia is perfectly natural in that respect. We, we have a sense of austerity sometimes. So you can see that the 1920s at one end, you know, in the very educated, sometimes moneyed classes, there's this very, um, kind of forward-looking decadent sense in the 1920s in high society. But across the, across the populace in general, 
um, there's a sense of austerity, which leads all the way up to, you know, the gold standard of 1925, the Wall Street crash, the Great Depression. And so it goes on. For the normal person, the interwar years were not a terribly happy time. And I must stop calling them the interwar years in that respect, because, of course, if you were if you were knocking about in 1932, you absolutely didn't know that these were the interwar years. That's a very important thing for historians to, to remember. To come on to your question, Ollie, the same is true of the 1950s. Um, you know, rationing didn't end until 1953, famously. Um, and politically and culturally, you know, we, we tend to write off the 1950s as this very dark, bleak, you only ever see black and white footage because of, you know, that's all that was available at the time. Um, but I think there is something to be said that after these periods of, of, of national trauma, I mean, goodness, dare I say, we may, we may see something equally as socially interesting over the next few years after living through something as difficult as, as, as what we're currently living through. Um, it does seem to be a social phenomenon that stretches back millennia. You know, Greek poets were writing pastoral poetry, uh, talking, about, talking about the countryside and idealizing the countryside after the great wars of ancient Greece. Um, when the Renaissance, what we now know as the Renaissance in 14th century Italy kicked into gear with increasing mechanization and industrialization of various things. What did the Italian poets do? They started writing pastoral poetry. So I think it's a very natural human reaction um, to A, be nostalgic and B, be slightly culturally austere after periods of great national and international trauma. Thank you, Sam. We've probably got time for another question. Has anybody else got another question they might like to ask at this stage? I, I certainly have plenty. I mean, I'm happy to. I'm happy to ask another interim one if anybody. Well, you have chairs. To... You have chairs privileged. Oh, oh do I? Yeah. <laughs> I'm just gonna. I'm gonna, gonna jump in then. Actually, if that's all right. Um, yeah. It's actually picking up on. I suppose it's on Lucy's point there. Lucy, Lucy's question about the sort of the influence and. I think what always struck me, um, I, mean, I know we haven't had the, had the opportunity to listen to some of the examples you were mentioning actually, but it's not, it's not English pastoral music in the same way that uh, some of the other composers you've mentioned. Um, and again, it's interesting to hear you talk about that kind of level of the sort of conservatism, which I guess must have run through his, you know, creative choices as it were. Yeah. And I wonder, yeah, I wonder, I suppose it's a question of sort of influence, but it's also it's a question of sort of fashionable acceptance. How, yeah, how, whether you think that he had some awareness of that, and I guess whether looking back on it now, we kind of think that there is actually a certain amount of English pastoralism that sort of sneaked in there, um, you know, or just being sort of imbued from his existence at that time. It's quite interesting sort of now we've got the, the benefit of hindsight looking, looking back and putting it in context with everything else. Yeah, I just wonder if you had any thoughts about all of that, that sort of general English pastoral school and... Yeah, I mean, when people talk about English pastoralism, one thing I like to play them is um, Vaughan Williams' Fourth Symphony, to say, okay, here's Vaughan Williams' Fourth Symphony, here's a pastoral composer, have a listen to this. And it's, you know, the most anti-pastoral symphony that you can imagine, which is great fun for, for, for yeah, getting over those kind of prejudices or expectations. Um, I, had to, I had to work quite hard, actually, to show Bliss as an occasional pastoralist, because, of course, he was making these claims all the time, um, against nostalgia, against pastoralism, um, about framing himself, and I think this was very conscious, framing himself as a progressive, as aligned with this, um, eventually, with the continental way of thinking progressively. First of all, French, but increasingly a kind of pan-European approach. Um, yeah, let, I'll talk about one particular piece of music, actually, if I may. Um, I'm aware of time, but I just want to talk about one piece of music because it may be one that people go away and listen to, actually. I'll give you a recommendation. And I might just say a quick thing about fashion, actually, seeing as you use that word, Ollie, as well. Um, Bliss's process of composition was sometimes at the piano, sometimes at his desk. Um, and he was a very accomplished pianist, but he tried not to rely on it too much. He would often, one, one thing he would do would, would be, he'd be working on something, he'd go to bed, He'd wake up the next day, play through the material he composed the day before, a little snippet, and see where his fingers took him afterwards, see if he, it took him any further than that. Um, and I think that partly explains why Bliss's music sometimes has an improvisatory feel. 
um, a la fantasia, you might call it, if you're being generous, a bit rambling, if you weren't. Um, but I find him most convincing where there's a real sense of rigorous logic, a clear plan, actually a sense of musical architecture, to use our analogy from this evening. He was capable of it, and I find it really frustrating when, that we only see it in glimpses. But similarly, he writes as well about very often needing what he calls a donné or trouvaille, something given or found, some external influence that was going to inspire him to get going with a piece of music. Um, and I'd say probably about two thirds of his music fits into that category, something that gets him going. And sometimes they actually end up with almost programmatic titles, these pieces of music. But again, it's the other third of his output, the pure music that I think is, is most convincing. So take, for example, Music for Strings of 1935. And could there be any title less programmatic? You know, it's literally, it's just music for string instruments. And he described that piece as going for a walk with a line, which sounds like an improvisation, but it actually isn't. Um, it has much more of a sense of preconceived logic, of rigour, of structure. It has that musical architecture. There wasn't a donné or true vibe that he needed. He was forced to generate the music and elaborate it far more abstractly than that. So I would say if you go away and listen to any piece of, if you Spotify any piece of bliss this evening, make it the first movement of Music for Strings and make it the Adrian Bolt and London Philharmonic recording as well. Um, can I just say something quickly about fashion? Is that okay? Yeah? Um, Why not? Because I, I, I hope that what I've said this evening is interesting um, from a descriptive structural point of view. You know, uh, Baroque architecture is full of ornament and so is Baroque music. Um, classical architecture is all about line and balance and music of the classical period is about line and balance as well. Um, but for me, I think these questions about aesthetics, prestige and fashion are really important. I, I, I used in my talk that phrase, I said something like, for bliss, prestige lay in the classical world or words to that effect. I, I'm not sure that's entirely original. I think I've co-opted that phrase from, from somewhere else and made it my own. Um, but Bliss was not at all the only British composer to take a trip to Italy and compose a piece of music about it when he got home. And I think we're all aware that having currency as a creative artist, uh, especially creative artists that we now call modernist, who were self-consciously experimenting, um, who were responding to a whole range of artistic and cultural uh, and social traditions even, I think that for them there is a great deal of extra prestige to be gained by demonstrating your currency uh, in your own artistic field. And we all do that consciously. Um, whether our intention is to demonstrate currency or not. You know, we do it through the art that we put on our walls. We do it through the food that we decide to cook. Um, we do it through the books. We, we do it through the backdrops that we choose to have behind us on our video call. You know, we are, we are consciously proving ourselves to be fashionable and current. And I think that Bliss's house, the house that I've structured the talk around this evening, Bliss's house is actually in that great tradition of conspicuous demonstration of style. Thank you, Sam. That's, that's a really good way to finish, I think. <laughs> thank you once again, uh, Sam. That was a fantastic thought. Thanks, Thanks for very much. And really, thank it. you to everybody for attending as well. Uh, that's great. It's worth saying, the only thing I wanted to say was just that the, obviously this is the last exchange talk of the series, this session. The next one, uh, I believe, is due to be Margaret Bennett on the 5th of October. That's what we're planning for so far. Um, so thank you very much, everybody, for coming along. Uh, nice to see your name virtually on the screen. <laughs> and thanks very much again, Sam.